family uh, just reminded me that there's a God who always cares for his children. Uh, I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk to you right now. He, he, you, all, you remind me of that. God will always, not sometimes, always take care of his children. I want to thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for that, for those messages in song. Good afternoon, Lyndon. Happy Sabbath. Yeah, you reflected my tone, and my tone was pathetic. So let's see if you could try that again. Uh, good afternoon, Lyndon. Happy Sabbath. Uh, I don't know, first time here, but you got to understand somebody's preacher. I like when persons are sitting in church and they look happy to be in God's house. Some of you look sad like you were forced to be here, like your husband or your wife said you got to go to church, or, or mommy or daddy said you had to go to church, like you don't want to be here. Uh, it's, not, it's not right for the upright to be uptight. If you sit here and I look at you and it looks like you, some of you are upset with God. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. Some of you have two. Some don't have any. Just, just find one of your neighbors. One of your neighbors. Just find one of your neighbors. And just turn to that neighbor. Anyone you want. Turn to that neighbor and say, Neighbor. You look good. Okay, that neighbor, that one didn't like you. Find another one. He didn't like you. No, no, she didn't like you. Find another neighbor. This time say, neighbor, you're good looking. <laughs> they want to change the good looking one now. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We got to be happy. We got to be happy. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when the psalmist said, let us go into the house of the Lord. His God was an average God. You could give him an average, mediocre praise. But our God is a great... Uh, if, if Jesus is as good as you claim he is, you ought not be able to keep quiet and keep him to yourself. That's why, as I get ready here to go into this sermon, I'm, I'm looking for someone... In Linden, who has an intimate relationship with God. Someone in Linden. Someone who, who don't need the past or the preacher, the, the elder, to tell you to praise your God. Someone, I wish there was one person here who could open up their mouth and praise God that says, Hey, you all don't know him like I know him. I wish Linden had one person like that. I'm struggling with something in 2019. I'm still struggling with the Seven Adventist Church because we appear that we need new reasons to shout. It appears that we need new reasons to praise and give God glory. But let me tell you something. If God makes his presence known at your sinful address, wakes your sinful self up, Every day gives money to your sinful self, knowing that you're going to do something sinful with that money. That's reason enough to walk into Linden on Sabbath and give God praise for saving a sinner. Uh, uh, I wish I had some praise, some worshipers in here. Somebody told me they know to worship God at Linden. Somebody told me. Uh, I, I just want to say uh, thank you so much. Someone told me that this is the premier church to go to in the Northeastern Conference. Are they correct? They told me this is the church. Uh, to go to in Northeastern. Because I've been all over preaching in Northeastern. They say, well, if you haven't preached at Linden, you haven't been anywhere yet. You haven't been anywhere yet. They say, this is the church. They say, this is the church. Let me say a hearty thank you to our first elder, Small, and uh, his team of elders. Thank you for the invitation to occupy God's pulpit here at Linden. Uh, before we go, I, I recognize the presence. You may not like this. 
uh, of Nashoni Chang. Nashoni, just stand with them, see you. You know I'm doing this. Uh, she was my classmate at seminary in Andrews. I, I've just finished Andrews. That's Nashoni Chang, a seminarian there from uh, Andrews University. We were classmates. Uh, we've been doing our Masters of Divinity. Uh, unfortunately, I had to leave her, but she's, she's on her way to get there. Uh, but because I just finished, I just finished. After God had my back, uh, then Nashoni had my back there at Andrews. Are you ready for the Word of God? Can we get down to God's business? Uh, God's business for you today. I was battling, praying. I had to send the information by Wednesday, but sometimes, sometimes when you get here, God says something else. So I was battling, uh, but God's message for you today is this. He is bringing you out. He is bringing you out. Every head in here is bowed and every eye in this place is closed. Our Father and our God, I pray for permission to join my human weakness to your divine strength. Daddy, rescue me from me. Make my preaching so thin in human wisdom that only the cross and the cross alone can be seen. All the glory is yours. But please, can you give us some blessings? We ask all of this in the name of the pre-existing, crucified, resurrected, and soon coming King, Jesus our Savior. Let the children of God say, Amen, amen and Amen. Make sure that you're in your Bibles, in the book of Acts. Uh, some of you, unfortunately, would have to depend on the screen. You don't take your Bibles to church anymore. But for the ones who have your Bibles, make sure you're in the book of Acts. The reason being, uh, sermons from this pulpit ought not to be opinionated. They ought to be based on this. And if you're not following in this, then you can't say, wait, 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 preacher, that's not in there if you're not following because I don't want you to leave Linden and say that the preacher said. I want you to leave here saying, the preacher read. Let me show you where he read it. So you have to follow the preacher. Check the preacher, please. Follow the preacher. We're in the book of Acts. We're in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through to 11. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through to 11. Acts chapter 12 begins with four words. Now about that time. Those four words give an entryway into this passage. However, now about that time demands that we go backwards before we go forwards into this passage. We will not understand this passage unless we know what comes before it. So if we truly to understand this passage clearly, we have to try to figure out why did Luke write about that time? So Dr. Luke, what happened at that time? Let's go back to chapter 11 to see what happened before that, that brought us to chapter 12. In chapter 11, the first thing that happened is that the church is experiencing a great revival. It was at Antioch that the outsiders were first called the disciples. They were first called Christians. It's right there in verse 25. A great revival was being experienced. Souls were being saved. A great number believed and turned to the Lord. It's right there in verse 21 of chapter 11. The second thing that happened in chapter 11 was that the church was impacting the community. The disciples were bringing aid and relief to brothers and sisters in Judea in response to a great famine that was about to come upon them. It's right there in verses 28 and 29. So in chapter 11, number one, souls were being saved. Number two, the church was impacting the community. 
So as a result of souls being saved, the church impacting the community, the church was now getting respect and gaining attention. The church was making such an impact on the community that the church started attracting the attention of the government. If you are a regular studier of your Bible and you read your Bible regularly, you would have discovered that whenever the church is really being the church, the government has to pay attention and the government has to respond. The problem with the church in Acts is that the church did not die when its leader died. The problem here is that they succeeded in killing the leader of the church. But the movement continued. And this church movement in Acts is now on fire and is saving souls, baptizing people, impacting the community. Now about that time. Now we get to chapter 12. Now the church is doing all of this. The government is paying attention and the government has to respond because the church is gaining more followers and impacting community. And, and even the government understands that our very best efforts at trying to stop this movement is to attack the pastor. Now about that time, the government steps up and this person by the name of Herod Agrippa the first is now imposing three strategies on the Jesus following movement. Now about that time, verse number one shows us his first strategy. He employs dictatorship. The verse reads, your Bible should read, he harasses some from the church. And not only did he employ dictatorship, but the second strategy he employed is death. Verse 2 says, they killed James, who was one of Jesus' inner circle boys. The third strategy was detainment. Verse 4 says, they arrested Peter. They put him in jail. They locked him up in a maximum security prison. They assigned 16 men to one man. Verse 4 says, is everything is in your Bible. Let's go to verse 4. They had four squads or, or quaternions of soldiers to hold him. A, a squad or a quaternion uh, consists of four soldiers. So four times four equals 16 men to guard one man. They ran shifts. While Peter was in jail to ensure that at all times there was four men looking at Peter. So every now and then four would leave and be replaced by another four. So they had 16 men in rotational shifts to look and guard Peter. So dictatorship, death, and detainment were all strategies used by Herod Agrippa against God's church. Let me pause here and let you know that there's a pattern here. We cannot ignore this pattern that has been going around this Jesus movement. And this pattern has led me to suggest that there is a Herod in every generation. Let me show you from the Bible. Some of you got it, but for those who didn't get it, let me show you from the Bible. Matthew chapter 2. Herod the Great authorized infanticide, kill all the male babies. He was hoping that Jesus would be among the casualties. Matthew chapter 14, his son, Herod Antipas, authorized the beheading of John the Baptist, who is the cousin of Jesus. Matthew chapters 26 and 27, Herod Antipas officiates the kangaroo trial of Jesus. And here in Acts 12, his grandson, Herod Agrippa, is killing off the members of Jesus' church. Okay, some of you didn't get the pattern, so we got to do it again. Matthew chapter 2. 
the granddaddy wants to kill Jesus as a baby. Matthew 14, his son kills the cousin of Jesus. Matthew chapters 26 and 27, the son authorized the kangaroo court of Jesus. And now in Acts chapter 12, here comes the grandson and he wants to kill the members of Jesus' church. Matthew chapter 2, the granddaddy wants to kill baby Jesus. Matthew chapter 14, the son kills Jesus' cousin. Matthew chapter 26 and 27, as the son holds a kangaroo trial of Jesus. And here in Acts 12, the grandson comes along and wants to kill Jesus' members. By now you ought to have noticed one thing. There's a Herod in every generation. The granddaddy, the son, and the grandson, there's a Herod in every generation. And don't you worry, you won't be bothered by them until you start making a difference for Jesus. Once you're not doing anything for Jesus, they won't bother you. When nobody is attacking you, it's because you ain't doing nothing for Jesus. Uh -huh. But the minute you start doing something for Jesus, the minute you start making a difference in the Queen's community on behalf of Jesus, expect your Herod to pop up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the church members are contending with dictatorship. They're contending with the death of one of their pastor's boys. They're contending with the detainment of their pastor. Let me try that again. They are dealing with dictatorship from the government. The death of one of God's children. They killed off James. And now they put their pastor in jail. And in response to the dictatorship, the death, and the detainment, the text says in verse 5, the church went into prayer. I'm going to try that again. The pastor has been put in jail. The pastor's boy has been assassinated. Some of the church members are being harassed by the dictatorship of the government. And the text says in verse 5, the church went into prayer. One more time for the Holy Ghost. Their pastor has been put in jail. Their pastor's boy has been assassinated. Some of the church members are being injured and harassed by the government. And the text says in verse 5, but the church went into prayer. Uh, you didn't react, some of you, because what you don't realize is that at the time of our text, Christianity looks like it ain't worth being a Christian. If being a Christian means I'm going to end up in jail. If being a Christian means I'm going to end up dead. If being a Christian means I'm going to end up being harassed by the government, then Christianity doesn't look like it's worth it. But the church members decided when Christianity didn't look like it was worth it, when it doesn't look like it's worth being a Seventh-day Adventist, I am still going to go to prayer meeting. Sometimes, prayer is not about getting an answer. Prayer is an act of telling the enemy, I'm not quitting on God. If there was one person here who would understand with me and can testify with me that some days you got to pray just to show the enemy that I'm not leaving church. I'm not getting out of ministry. I'm not leaving where God has planted me because I will let nothing separate me from the love of Christ Jesus. So sometimes you've got to pray so the enemy will know you're not quitting on God. And by the way, that's why you must have a prayerful life. If you only pray when you're in trouble, then you are in trouble. Let me talk to this side over here. If you only pray when you're in trouble, then you are in trouble. Text says the, the church went into prayer. Brothers and sisters, if you can get past the paradox of being a Christian... You will discover God in a fresh and revitalized way. 
So the church is having prayer meeting. They were having prayer meeting at an undisclosed location. They are having prayer meeting at an undisclosed location. The text says they were praying to God for Peter. Because the next day Peter is going to be executed. The church members had prayer in an undisclosed location. And while they are praying, heaven releases an angel that goes to the prison where Peter is at. They had prayer meeting at an undisclosed location. And while they're having prayer at an undisclosed location, heaven releases an angel to go to Peter's prison. They had prayer meeting. Nobody knows where they are at an undisclosed location. And while they're praying, heaven releases an angel to go to Peter's prison. So the church members are talking to God, but God is not telling them what he's doing. They are at prayer meeting at an undisclosed location. They are talking to God, but God is not telling them what he's doing. He sends an angel to where they are not while they are praying where they are. You missed it. 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 If you're not only reading your Bible, but you also study your Bible, this text is teaching us that God does not have to wait until you are finished praying to answer your prayer. God can answer your prayer while you are still talking to him. Alright, some folks didn't get it still. Some most of you got it. While they are praying over there, God releases an angel to Peter in the prison. Let me tell you something, Lyndon. God can move faster than when you get done talking to him. Because he already knows how to respond to your prayer before you even get up off your knees. Last night he answered your prayer even when you did not even know what to say to him. Tonight he's going to answer your prayer before you even finish praying to him. While you're in prayer, God is already handling your situation. He does not have to wait until you finish praying. To answer it. I used this illustration before. You know, I was going home one night. I was trying to stay away from junk food. So this is back then. Uh, I was going home one night when I was in Berrien Springs. Not much fast food places there. So I, I made a stop at McDonald's. This is back then, not now. Back, back, back then, Berrien Springs. Not now, naturally. Not now, not now. And I made a stop at McDonald's and... Uh, I went to the drive through window and I, I made an order. Don't ask me what I ordered. I just made an order. So I made an order at the drive through window at McDonald's. Again, for the record, back then, not now. Uh, I, I, and, I, and then I, I, the lady said to me, sir, you can collect your order at the next window. So I pulled up to the second window. And when I pulled up to the second window, uh, as soon as I pulled up there, they, they handed me the order. So, you know me now, I, I, I opened the bag, I said, no way, to make sure he was correct. Because I just saw that the first window, got to the second window, they handed me the bag. So I said, lady, I said, hey ma'am, how did you get that ready so fast? She didn't know she was talking to a pastor. She said to me, sir, while you were at the first window, you were placing your order. And your order was going to the cook. And while you were saying it, they were working on it. So by the time you got to the second window, what you asked for was already ready. You all don't know how to get excited, so I get excited by myself. While you're talking to God and you're putting your order into heaven, heaven is already working on your order. And before you get to where you need to be, God has already handled your situation. Uh, neighbor, while you're trying to figure it out, God has already worked it out. God doesn't have to wait until you finish praying. He can handle your situation while you're talking to him. So heaven releases an angel to Peter's prison. God didn't tell the church members who were praying what he was doing, but he was already handling the situation. The church members are talking to God about the situation. God releases an angel in Peter's prison. 
they're praying for Peter to get out of jail. God sends an angel to Peter who is still in jail. Lyndon, sometimes prayer is not about getting you out. Prayer is about getting God in. Stop trying to get out of your situation and saying, God, I've been praying to you. God is saying, no, no, no. Stay where you are because I got into it with you. Prayer sometimes is not about getting you out. It's about getting out. Peter was still in jail. While we are talking, God releases an angel into Peter's prison. Peter does not get out of prison. God steps in to prison. The three Hebrew boys. I'm going to make sure you get it. Before they stepped out, God stepped into the fire with them. Prayer is not always about getting you out. Sometimes it's about getting God in. They prayed for Peter to get out. Instead, heaven went to jail. I'm in Bible. I'm in Bible. Peter wasn't out yet. He was still in, even though they were praying, he was still in jail. As a matter of fact, he was sleeping. Oh boy, they don't know their Bible on here. Verse 6, verse 6, verse 6. Yeah, was he sleeping? Am I wrong or am I? Was he? Check the pastor. He was sleeping. Verse 6. Now, I don't want you to forget that they had 16 men assigned to this one man. That's a very critical piece of this passage. Why are you putting 16 men to guard one man? Why? Can I tell you why? Because Peter has a history surely, of getting out of jail. I thought you all knew your Bible here. Chapter 4, he was in jail got out. Chapter 5 and 6, he went to jail, got out. Chapter 12, the head of the prison says, the prison head says, no, 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 hold on this time. We need some more security because every time you put this guy in jail, he keeps getting out. Can I tell you why the devil continues to pick on you? Because you have a history that every time you're in trouble, you keep getting out. Every time you are sick, God heals you. Every time you get broke, God gives you a breakthrough. Every time the kids are stressing you out, God keeps you in your right mind. Every time the cupboards are empty, God puts food on your table. Every time you think the exams are too hard, God keeps giving you those A grades. Every time you go to the doctor for the diagnosis, God keeps confusing them. They say, hey, we can't find the cancer anymore. Every time you're in trouble, God keeps bringing you out. So the devil knows you have a history of God always bringing you out. So this time he says, I need some more demons to attack this one from Linden. Because he or she always gets out. So not this time, Peter. 16 men for you this time. You're not getting out this time. Heaven goes to jail. The text says, verse 7, a light shone in the prison. Verse 7, a light shone in the prison. Can I, can I tell you a problem with that? Light shining in the prison, Peter is asleep. Peter can't see no light. I thought you were in the Bible. Peter is sleeping. So when the light shines, He can't see the light. He's asleep. So when the angel shows up in prison and the light shines in the prison, Peter doesn't see the light. That means the only people that saw the light was the guards. I'm going somewhere. Understand. God realizes that in a time like this, God understands that he cannot get Peter out of prison until he gets Peter free 
from people. Because Peter is not chained to the prison. Peter is chained to the people who are keeping him in prison. Can I ask you a question, those of you? Can I ask you a question? Who are you chained to? In order to get him out of prison, he got to break away from the people he's chained to because his problem is not the prison. No way in Bible can you prove to me. Peter was not chained to the prison. He was chained to the guards. Sometimes God shows up in your life to break you free from restrictive relationships because you are chained to some people whose only goal are to keep you down. Sometimes, if you're going to progress in life, there are some folks you just got to get away from them. I'm in Bible, I'm in Bible, I'm in Bible, I'm in Bible. Because it's not the place that you're chained to, it's the people. And typically those people who you're chained to, who try to keep you down, uh, they're typically employees of the enemy. They work for the SBI, Satan's Bureau of Investigations. Elder, they can handle this kind of, they can handle the real preaching in London. Should I sugarcoat it or can, break, they can be playing with them? Can I talk to them? Can I, can I just talk to you? Can you handle it? No sugarcoating. They're real. You, you can handle it? Well, let me park my car here for a bit then, since you gave me permission. Let the record show they gave me permission. They said they can handle it. There are some of us who have become deputized as a card carrying member of the SDA PD. They gave me permission. The Seventh-day Adventist Police Department. And their role is to police worshipers and police the members and police the pastor and police the conference. And then I recently learned that the SDAPD has various divisions. I didn't even know that. I thought it was just one Seventh-day Adventist Police Department. But I learned that there were different divisions. Uh, I found out that there was the Diet Division. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Those are the ones that patrol the potlucks uh, to make sure that fruits and vegetables are on your plate. That's the Diet Division of the SDAPD. Uh, then we have the Doctrinal Division of the SDAPD. Uh, they're the ones who respect the pastor, the elder sermon for doctrinal accuracy. Uh, uh, to make sure, pastor, uh, you didn't quote LNGY properly. That's the doctrinal division of the SAPD. Uh, then we have the largest division of the SAPD. Lots of officers in this division. This one is the wardrobe division. Uh, these ones, they go around checking. Uh, let me make sure that the, oh, the skirt is too short. That one is too tight. They inspect what you wear to show. Uh, those, those are the wardrobe division of the SAPD. Uh, uh, th then we, we have, we have the, 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 the praise and worship division of the SAPD. Those are the ones who you call the emotional police patrol. And their duty is to reprimand worshippers who they think are praising God too much uh, and they're shouting hallelujah too loud. Uh, uh, those people tend to think that quiet equals reverence uh, and stillness equals spirituality. Let me tell you something. Uh, there's shouting and rejoicing in heaven. Lots of noise in heaven when one person goes down into the pool. What quiet heaven you're talking to me about? This tells me that when one person goes in a pool, there's a celebration. Read Revelation for them on the instruments up there. And then you're telling me, shh, be still and be silent. Shh, be re really? Back over now. The light shine in the prison. 
But the light, they gave me permission, Artino. But the light was not for Peter. The light was for the people he was chained to. And so here's the problem. Even though the light is shining brightly, Peter is still sleeping. He is not aware that he has been set free. So in verse 7, the angel, remember he's free now, but he's sleeping. So the angel had to, wake up. Is, there, is it there? You are making me second guess myself. Is it there? Did the angel, yes, yes, yes. The angel had to hit him on his side and wake him up. This point is not for all of you. It's, it's for people like me. Because if the angel does not wake Peter up, Peter is going to be in prison longer than he needs to be. He's going to be free and still in prison. You'll get that point around 11.30 on Monday morning. So the angel wakes up Peter. Peter says, hey, yo, 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 what's going on? The angel says, hey, man, it's time to go. Put on your shoes. Get your garment on. Put on your garment. We've got to get out of here. Gird yourself. Type your sign. Put on your clothes. Got to get out of here. Verse 8. Well, let's stay here for one minute here because Peter was married. Right? They don't know Peter was married. Mark chapter 1 verse 30. Jesus stopped by the house of Peter's mother-in-law. All right, good. Okay. So Peter was married. Good. So Peter got a wife. And based upon him having a wife, Peter is not going to willingly derobe himself in front of the other four 16 men. Peter have a wife. He's not going to do that willingly. Stay with the preacher now. If he's got a wife, he's not going to be naked in front of the 16 men. No real man is going to get naked in front of these 60 men voluntarily which means what the Bible is trying to tell you here there's a reason why the Bible put that in here I'm trying to draw it to your attention there's a reason why the Bible doesn't make mistakes every word in here is there for a reason there's a reason why the Bible let us know that Peter was partially naked and said put on your clothes there's a reason for that at some point they forced him to take his robe off and his shoes off. This was a means of adding shame to his detainment. All right, you're with me now. Okay, okay. So, so the first thing the angel says after waking him up is to tell him, get up, put your clothes on. Because it's time to bring you out. But I'm not going to bring you out like that and let you get exposed. I wish I had at least 10 people in here who can testify that God may not keep you out of trouble, but at least you need to thank him that when he brought you out, uh, he did not let you get exposed. Because there's certain stuff that was said about you, and what was said about you was absolutely true. And if he ever gets out, you know you're going to be in trouble. If it's one thing I can't stand, it's fake Christians. I'm allergic to fake Christians. We are the people who can testify. I'm not just happy that God brought me out. I'm happy that he didn't expose me, the pastor. The real Christians now, not the holy ones I'm talking about. The real Christians now. When he brought me out, he covered me. I'm talking to the real Christians who, could, who can admit you are one social media button click away from a scandal, but God covered you. You are one business meeting away, but God brought you out and he didn't let you get exposed. He covered you. You are one work meeting away from being fired, but God covered you. You are one meeting away from being expelled from school, but God covered you. Now all this is going on and Peter thinks it's not real. He thinks he's seeing a vision in verse 9. Verse 9 says, he did not know what was done by the angel. Thought it was a vision. Translation. Peter is still not in his conscious mind. 
The angel escorts him out of the prison cell. They go past the first and second guard posts. Then they get to the iron gate. And the text says the gate opened of its own accord. There's another sermon there by itself. Then they went out in the street. And then the angel left him. Verse 11 says, And when Peter had come to himself, which means all what I just described, the Bible doesn't make a mistake, Peter was not yet to himself. I got to backtrack. I got to backtrack till you get it. Uh, he was in prison cell asleep. Yes, the angel showed up. The light shone and you didn't see the light. The angel had to wake you up. When you woke up, you thought you were dreaming. The angel covered you. And then took you out to various stages of the prison. All the way out to the street. And then after all of that, the text says, when Peter had come to himself. Lyndon, in times like these, God's escape plan for you does not include your reasoning or your intellect. Sometimes, God's got to bring you out of what you're going through and leave you out of the logistics at the same time. Because God ain't got time to ask you for your opinion. How do you want to be brought out? How do you want it done? You got fired from you. How do you want me to give you another job? You have issues in your marriage. How do you want me to fix it? God don't have time. God will bring you out and leave you out at the same time. God will do something for you that you don't have any participation in. Because if you could have participated in your own escape plan, not only would some of us want to give God our opinions, some of us would want to be in charge. God, I got this. I've done it already. So God can't tell you because you're saying, God, yeah, yeah. When, 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 when I got fired from the last job, this is what I did. How do you know that God's going to do it the same but this time around? Verse 11 says, when Peter came to himself, he said, no, I know for sure that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. Verse 11 says that. I got to give God glory because I escaped the expectation of the Jewish people. Let me translate that for you. They saw me go in and they thought that since I went in, I was not going to come out. But what they don't know is before I got out, God came in. And that's the message for someone at Linden today. Before you come out, God is going to step in. And when God brings you out, he will not bring you out the way the people of Queens are expecting. Yes, some of them, the people, they saw you in trouble and they don't believe you're going to come out. But I'm here to encourage you today to trust the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. If it had not been for the Lord... On my side. Where? Acts chapter 12. That passage. is about a good preacher. Who went into a dark cell. But God stepped in. And brought him out. And that sounds like someone. You already know. Because Jesus. Went into a dark tomb. But early Sunday morning, God stepped in and brought him out. And in this Bible, God has over 300 different names. And he uses a different one to suit your situation when he's bringing you out. I got myself in trouble and ended up in prison. But Jehovah Nisi gave me victory and brought me out. I got really sick. The doctor didn't know what to do with me. But Jehovah Rapha healed me and brought me out. I didn't have any money to go grocery shopping. 
But Jehovah Jireh provided and brought me out. Uh, I was getting failing grace. I couldn't pass my exam in school. But El Shaddai showed up uh, and brought me out. Uh, I was on the verge of giving up. But Elohim showed up and brought me out. Depending on your situation, God would have a different name. But he'll show up and God will bring you out. ago I was brought here and I was I was preaching to everybody in here that moment is done now I'm letting you know this is not for everybody in here the one person I'm talking to is a person who came to Linden today having no idea who the preacher was what the message was what they want to hear they had no idea that's the one person I'm talking to now that one person who you came to church last night, you were crying yourself to sleep. Don't ask me how I know it. That one person, all hell was breaking loose in your life this week. As a matter of fact, there's someone else who just lost a loved one and you're saying, God, you're questioning him. God, why? I've been there. Two years ago, my mother died. I said, God, what are you doing? That one person who says, God, why are innocent people being shut down in mass shootings in Ohio? That one person who's here, you're saying, God, I may not understand what you're doing, but I trust you and I will never give up on you. That one person, you're standing. The rest of you, stay where you are. Actually, pray for those who are standing. Head the board, eyes are closed. That one person is standing. Just, I'm not talking to everybody now. Just that one person. You're saying, God, I may not have everything going on with me right now. I'm struggling, but I believe that you're still going to handle my business, that one person is standing. The rest of you, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You're praying. You're praying. There's someone else. You're having immigration problems. You're saying, God, I've been going through immigration issue for years now. I, I don't think this God, but you believe he's going to do it. You two are standing. The rest of you stay seated. This is not for everybody. 
just those persons that are saying, God, I trust you. I believe your promises are certain. You are standing. Wherever you are, you are standing. The rest of you stay seated. And pray for those who are standing. There's one other person. You're going to sing again. You're going to sing again, praise team. There's one other person. There's one other person here. Not only are you going through issues on your job, not only are you stressed out at home with your children, not only are there issues with your marital spouse, but even right now you're saying, Lord, sometimes even in church, I, I, I don't feel like, I, I just feel like, God, where are you? Are you going to bring me out? You two are standing. You two are standing. You two are standing. You're saying, God, I know you're able. I know you're able. The rest of your heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The final person God is talking to, the final one, the final one. You'll be going to doctor after doctor, doctor after doctor. You're still having a pain in the knee. Yeah, I know you still have that issue. The doctor don't know what's going on. You're saying, God, I know you know, and in your time, you're going to fix it. You're standing. You're standing. They're standing all over for God. Jesus, they see you. Jesus sees you. They're standing. They're standing. They're standing. They're standing. We're going to go a little further though. We're going to go a little further. As I get ready to sing. I'm going to ask you if you're sitting. Yes, sing. While you're standing. I don't believe in begging people to come. If you're standing. And you believe that God can save you. You believe he's going to do it for you. You believe he's going to bring you out. You're saying, God, I trust you. Just step right out and come to Jesus. Don't come to the pastor. Step right out and come to Jesus. Come right up front to Jesus. Just that one person. That one person. Not everybody. Not everybody. I'm not in everybody's business. You're saying, God, when you come, I want to be saved. You are coming. You're coming. You're right here. Sing, sing. Let them come. Sing. They're coming. Sing. If you don't believe it, that's okay. But if you believe, you're struggling, you're crying. Come, come. I know you're dealing with the death in your family, but you trust it. Come. Sing, praise him. Sing, sing, sing. They're coming to Jesus. Don't come to the pastor. Come to Jesus. Come. They're coming. They're coming to Jesus. They're coming. Press closer. Press closer. This is just for those who are front, not for everybody. Press closer. He sees those tears. He's okay to cry. Come. 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 Press closer. Press closer. Let him come. Let him come. Let him come. Let him come. Come. Sing. Sing. I say this, then the praise is going to sing. I'm not going to ask anybody to come. That's between you and God, but they're going to sing one final time. I know that you've heard over and over and over and over again, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. I know you heard it from since you were a child. I know that. And I know you also heard that there's, there, there, there's, there's a final judgment that's coming somewhere in the future. I know you heard that. Probation is going to be closed somewhere. I know you heard that. But I'm here to tell you today. By the power of God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want you to understand. That if you leave this church now. Get in your car. And die in a car accident. Jesus has just come for you right then and there. Because it's a lie from the pit of hell. That when he comes back, he's going to ask you any questions. That's a lie. You are answering the questions now. Right now you're saying, Jesus, I'm not on your side. I'm on the devil's side. Or by the way you live your life. 
all you have is now. If you think you have until tomorrow to clean, that's okay. If you're not for sure, I'm going to get up tomorrow, that's okay. But if you think it's the old time you have and you know you're not saved, you need to be up front. The final thing. The time is coming. When even though you're praying, even though you're praying, Yes, Jesus is interceding on your behalf. And I can hear him saying, saying, Father, not yet. Not yet. There's still that one person in Linden. That one person in Linden. Yeah, that, that woman. Yeah, that man, that young girl, that young boy. If I go now, he or she is going to be lost. Not now, Father. Not yet. There's one in Linden still. One in Linden still. There's one in Linden. But I want to let you know, I think I'm ready to sing, because I'm done. Once I sing, you're either coming or you're not to Jesus. I want to let you know that the time will come when after all the pleadings of Jesus to tell the Father, hold, no, not yet. There's one still in Linden. The Father will say, son, no more. That one had enough time to choose me. Son, go get my children. When he comes, where will you be? Where will you be? Father, I did my part. You know I did my part. I told them about you. I gave them a chance to come to you. It's now in your hands. If you want to come, come. Come. As you get ready to pray and talk to God. Sing. Sing as they come. Sing. Sing. standing as we go to the throne of grace we're going before our majestic father so assume the position as we're going for our father everyone standing if you're physically capable of standing you are if you're not then you can stay seated we're getting ready to pray and this prayer is not for the church this prayer is for those in faith who came up front to Jesus Every head is bowed and every eye is closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You're either standing in the back or you came in front and you, you're still saying, he, he didn't ask me, but I, I want to study the Bible. I want to know it like he knows it. So that one, I didn't want you to come forward. All I want you to do is put your hand up, say you want to study the Bible some more, take it down. I want to study the Bible some more, you stick it up and take it back down. I want to study it some more. I see you. Yes, I see you. One day, I see you. Another one. You want to, just to keep it up. Keep the hand up. Keep your hand up. Let me see. Keep it. Let's say, Lord, see you. Keep the hand up. You want to study the Bible some more. Bible study. Bible study. Bible study. Bible study. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And, and there's somebody else in a dangerous Bible study. You, you didn't move, but you're saying, you're saying, I, 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 I want to be baptized. I want to do it. Heads about eyes are closed. You're praying. I, I want to do it. I want to do it. Just put it up and take it back down. That hand. You, I, I want to do it. I, I know I, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized. Put your hand up and take it back down. Where are you? Where are you? Bible study baptisms. Just up and back down. Up and back down. Up and back down. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. We're praying. We're getting ready to pray. 
our Father and our God. We come to you now in no other name but the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, before I go any further, even though I prayed, they prayed over me in the office, I prayed again before I got up here to speak, I prayed again before I started speaking. I I'm still going to ask you for the fifth, six, seven, eight, nine, ten time, whatever's inside of me, any iniquity that's inside of me, anything inside of me that's unlike you, get it out, please. Because I need this prayer to go beyond the ceiling of Linden Church and get to your throne. Please get it out of me as I intercede on behalf of your people. Father, before we even ask you for anything, we want to first say thank you for everything. Thank you for health. Thank you for strength. Thank you for food on our tables. Thank you for waking us up this morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't thank you enough for being better to us than we can be to ourselves. Father, even though we try, at times we, we do things that we are not to do. We are sinners. We, we, we keep messing up. We do stuff that, that hurts you. We, we do stuff that it will break your heart. And we asking you, please forgive us. We are sorry. We saw ourselves at your mercy seat. Have mercy on us, Lord. We are sorry. Forgive us. Things we've done, things we don't even realize we're doing wrong. We say we are sorry. Forgive us. We beg for mercy and grace. Father, you brought me all the way from Long Island down the, down the Southern State Parkway to come here to preach your word. I, I was obedient to you. I, I did what you asked me to do by your strength. And you also asked me to call on your people. And ask those who, who, who are struggling, who are going through issues, who, who are suffering, but they're serving you. You told me to ask them to come forward. And they came not to the preacher. They came to you. Jesus, you see them up front here right now. They're here to you. Father, one of them came up front. Who's sick. I need healing. Jesus, for that one who's up front here now, could you show that one that you're still in the healing business? There's another one who came up front. Have some issues in their house. Could you show up? And show them a way out. There's another one who came up front having issues at work. Father, show up on the job and give them a solution. There's another one who came up front. He or she haven't worked in years. Could you please, Lord, give them a breakthrough? Father, your children are suffering. They're serving you, but they're hurting some of them came up front and they had tears in their eyes, but they came to you. Lord, for that one who's up front, the one here who's right here right now and, and, and you can see the tears trickling down their face. For that one who's up front who's crying right now, can you go to them not after the prayer, but while I'm praying, can, can you whisper in their ear and tell them, weeping, May endure for a night. But tell them, Father, that joy is coming in the morning. Can you tell that one who's crying that, please? Father, for the one who's up front, who's hurting and, and struggling, and they didn't want to come to church today, and, and they feel like letting you go. Father, they feel so weak, they're trying to hold on to you, and they feel like letting you go. Jesus, can you hold on to them? Hold them and don't ever let them go. They came forward to say they trust you. They believe that you're able to do what you say you're going to do. They trust your promises. Father, we know that you're coming back. You said so in your word. You said you're coming back. 
And when you come back, we want you to tell each and every one in this house today, in your house. We want you to look at each one of them and tell them, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant in linen. Come and see. Come. And you show them all those mansions you have up there for them. Father, for all the things you've done for us last week, we say thank you. Father, for all the things you've done for us today on your Sabbath day, just this morning, we say thank you. And for all the things you're going to do for us next week, we say thank you in advance. Father, this is my prayer. That everyone up front who came forward to you, that when they leave this church, that sometime soon they'll have a testimony that you showed up and you brought them out. And it's my prayer that everyone, everyone in Linden right now, in the sound of my voice, that when you come back, Father, save all of us in your kingdom. This is our prayer in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, let the children of God say, Amen, amen and Amen. As, as they sing, before you go back, I want you to do one thing. Just do like what the preacher do. Hug one person and tell them, see you in the kingdom. See you in the kingdom. Just hug one person. Sing. Sing as they go back. Sing. Hug one person. Say, see you in the kingdom. God bless you. See you in the kingdom. Sing. Sing as they go back. Sing. Sing. Hug them. Hug them. Hug them. Hug them. See you in the kingdom. Hug them. See you in the kingdom. Meeting us where we are today and taking us where you would love us to go. We thank you for showing us the way out, wherever our circumstance might be. And now, dear Lord, we pray that your grace would rest upon us. And may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. Rest, remain, and abide with us until the day you return. May we hear the well done in that day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.